Hello Seattle Four Rotarians, this is President Kim speaking to you from the ProMotion Art Studio, the company that records our programs each week. Due to the COVID-19 virus, our public health officials recommend against meetings of 10 or more people. Therefore, we will follow that guidance and are not meeting today. However, we're very pleased to offer you an online program. It consists of an invocation from Nick Anderson, a song from our Rotary Library performed by past presidents Bill Center and Todd Sommerfeld, and then a program from Race Bouillon of World Without Hate. I really miss seeing you all, but I am so glad we can offer you this online program and that you can stay focused on safeguarding your health. Fellow Rotarians, as we gather together virtually, I wanted to bring in a prop, something that we could connect around. So I'm wearing my Christmas jacket. Now I'm standing in front of a green screen, so it might be weird, like half of me might be missing. But, um, you know, I just think back at that time, it was so fun as we engaged in fellowship. And the truth is, for many of you, I'm always just going to be the 12 Days of Christmas guy. So, so here it is. I've got a little spoken word invocation for us today. I want to ask you to lean in and pay attention because this one's going to go fast. You see, it's been 77 days since Christmas, and you don't want to miss this. If we were in the Westin, I'd say, please sit. But here we are. We're gathered near and far on Skype and YouTube, Zoom and WhatsApp. Check your screens and your Twitter feeds. Let technology bring us together to connect and reflect. Let technology make us better, please. Join me as we engage in fellowship, in friendship, in kinship. They all say it's hip, at least that's what they say. But wait, they? Who are they? The hipsters, the tech misters, the bro code and the code bros and the Bernie bros and crew. You see, it's easy to other anyone. It doesn't matter who. They, them, the others. Today, it's the person in the mask coughing on the bus and mixing in with us. And I'm like, hey, what the, f but wait, who are we? You and me, she and he together, aren't we rotary? We care first and we seek truth and beneficiality for all of humanity. And compassionately, we are loving and loving and loving each other. So stand with me. That's right. Get out of your chair. Put your derriere in the air and stand with me. Take a stance and be for rotary, for truth and fairness, for goodwill and friendships for all. Open the pages. Listen to the sages over all the ages. Let the silver linings in the playbook play as we hear the voice of the Most High say that in all things I will do good. Think with me on that, simmer on that fact. In all things, there is good. In all things, there is good. Amen. My, my friend and I decided we should start the year with a song about Rotary Fellowship. If you know, uh, if you've seen any of the Toy Story movies, this song's burned in your brain. If you haven't, just talk the words until you've learned the tune. You've got a friend in me. You've got a friend in me. When the road looks rough ahead and you're miles and miles from your nice warm bed, you just remember what your old pal said. You got a friend in me. Yeah, you got a friend in me. You've got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. You got troubles, I got them too. We there stick isn't anything I wouldn't do for you. We stick together and we see it through. Cause you got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. Some of the folks might be a little bit smarter than I am, bigger and stronger too. Maybe. But none of them will ever love you the way I do. It's me and you. Oh, and as years go by, a friendship will never die. You 
To all my fellow Rotarians, though we meet through the virtual airways, I'm honored to be here with you today. My name is Reis Bhuyan, the founder and president of World Without Hate. A very special thank you to President Kim, Mariah, and the team at Promotion Arts for helping to make this special program possible. Where are you from? Not a typical question to ask during an armed robbery. The cash I placed on the counter in exchange for my life remained untouched. The heavily tattooed man wearing a bandana, sunglasses, and a baseball cap pointed a sort of double barrel shotgun straight at my face. His gaze remained fixed. Despite pleading for my life, he showed no mercy. He pulled the trigger from point-blank range. In an instant, a life full of dreams, promises, and joy came to a screeching halt. I found myself in my own pool of blood, struggling to survive. I will never forget the sound of my shooter's voice asking me, where are you from, right before pulling the trigger. And I will never forget the same voice 10 years later telling me, I love you, bro. Might seem hard to believe. We all face difficulties in life, while some are harder, more painful, even life-threatening. The challenges we go through take us on a journey, a journey of self-discovery, inner strength, and empowerment. Right now, in this moment, while all of our lives have turned upside down and inside out, it may seem impossible to look at something like the coronavirus pandemic and see anything but catastrophe. Yet, the human capacity to rise above, even in the most difficult of times, always has a way of shining through. In times of crisis and hardship, it is normal to feel helpless, isolated, frightened, and even betrayed. When there seems to be no hope, no support, no easy way out, what do we do? Should we give up? Even when it feels like the entire world has betrayed you, do you betray yourself? You most certainly should not. You have the power to transform negatives into positives, weakness into strength, ignorance into wisdom, hate into love, and fear into courage. If you truly believe things happen for a reason, and something good and meaningful comes from negative situations, we can find our inner strength to stay positive in difficult times, find peace in the midst of chaos, and the courage to never give up. 19 years ago, because of my fear of big, bald-headed white men with tattoos, I secluded myself behind the four walls of a small house in Texas. At the time, I believed my fear, anxiety, and the feelings of helplessness were reasonable. Ten days after 9-11, as I stood behind the register of a mini-mart in Dallas, my would-be killer walked in. He shot me in the face from point-blank range, leaving me for dead on the cold, concrete, convenience store floor. Like millions of others, I came to the United States, leaving my family and my career in the Bangladeshi Air Force, hoping to fulfill my academic pursuits and American dream. The shooting was the beginning of a series of extreme hardships and betrayal that I faced, turning my American dream into an American nightmare. Less than 24 hours after my attack, the hospital I was taken to discharged me, telling me to arrange follow-up treatments on my own. 
I lost my home, my job, my sense of security, and my fiancé. After four painful surgeries, I lost vision in my right eye. The right side of my face and skull was and remains peppered with more than three dozen bullet fragments. I was left with more than $60,000 in medical debt. I reached out to the Red Cross only to be told I was eligible for just one week's worth of groceries. Except for my life, I lost everything. But I would not and did not give up. The promises I made to myself and my family were far more powerful than giving up because of the fear, isolation, and uncertainty I felt. It was extremely painful, extremely difficult living in a foreign country without my loved ones. Now with crippling injuries, a lack of support, and on top of it all, the constant terror of getting attacked again. I hit rock bottom in my dream country. But I used that bottom as a solid foundation to learn and grow. I could not and would not keep myself imprisoned indefinitely. I slowly began to rebuild my life, attending computer science classes while also working as a waiter. I transformed myself from airman to store clerk to waiter to survive. I saw the opportunity to work in, a, in restaurants as a chance to learn more about Americans. I hadn't thought it would also be the place where I would confront one of my biggest fears, large, bald-headed white men with tattoos. Within a few weeks of working as a waiter, I got a table with three men who reminded me of my attacker. I was scared to death. My manager and mentor, an African-American gentle giant with a huge sense of humor, found me at the back of the restaurant, paralyzed with fear. With hesitation, I opened up and briefly told him about my story. He looked me in the eyes, grabbed my shoulder, and said, I understand your fear. We will work on it together. You trust me? I nodded, but just wanted to, but just wanted him to put me on break until they left. I took this job hoping it would allow me to stay busy, learn American culture, perfect my English, and help me to earn a living. Yet I was stuck battling my fears and my desire to overcome them. What if they are actually my attacker's buddies? Would they wait for me outside in the parking lot to finish the job? What if trying to overcome my fear ends up costing me my life? Too many ifs and buts circled around in my head. I felt torn. I knew Richard would protect me inside the restaurant. But what about outside? Let's go, man, Richard urged, tapping my shoulder. As we both stood near the table, Richard put his black face next to my brown face and with humor in his voice, greeted the table. Hello, folks. My name is Pete, and this is Repeat, my twin brother separated at birth. The party burst into laughter. Richard continued, Repeat is your server this evening, and I am his backup. If Repeat does not do a good job taking care of you, don't be ugly to him. Just call me. I will take care of you. I will take care of everything. Everyone kept laughing. I looked at their smiling faces seeing joy and happiness. And for a moment, I forgot my fears. I saw them just as human beings, different from me in every way possible, having a good time. Hey, repeat, one of them joked. Are you gonna take our drink order, man? My twin brother, Pete, left the table 
giving me a wink as you walked away. Each one of us faces difficulties in which we feel powerless and unable to face the fears before us. Instead, remaining complacent to the way things are. It's natural to feel this way, but I urge you to reach deeply, knowing we each have tremendous power within ourselves. We have the power to make peace with our pain, to see things once overshadowed by dread more clearly, to move forward and, and to also help others do so as well. As you nurture this power within you, you will find ways of making the seemingly impossible possible. Thanks to my manager, Richard, kind Americans who stepped forward and by the mercy of God, I was indeed able to eventually rebuild my life. I found a good IT job, settled in my own apartment, and in 2009, was fortunate enough to go on a religious pilgrimage with the mother. In Mecca, I had the opportunity to reflect upon my shooting and my attacker. He was now sitting on death row for taking the lives of two innocent men and nearly taking mine. I deeply felt by executing Mark, we would simply lose a human life without dealing with the root cause. Instead, Instead of hating him, I saw Mark as a human being like me, not just a killer. I saw him as a victim too. I suffered terribly, but did not see any value in him suffering as well. My faith and my upbringing, the powerful stories of mercy and forgiveness I learned in my childhood, gave me the courage not only to forgive Mark, but also fight to save the life of the man who tried to end mine. Mark soon came to know about me and the diverse coalition who rallied together to get him removed from death row. I was told he was reduced to tears and deeply touched by our efforts. In a statement he said, In a free world, I was free, but locked up in a prison inside myself, because of the hate I carried in my heart. He thanked the entire Muslim community and condemned his own acts of violence and called me brother in a phone conversation. Here is Mark in his own words. For this man to forgive me, which I've done unforgivable, for him to come forward the way he did, it speaks volume. It speaks volume for the human race. Ah, uh, Mr. Reyes, thank you for your your inspiring act of, of compassion towards me. You have forgiven me. You have forgiven the unforgivable. And uh, I have a lot of love and respect for you. For the Patels, the Hassans, thank you all for what y'all have done. Uh, your, the question is, if I don't make it, what do I want you to carry on? Man, just what you're doing today is, is remarkable. To, you know, to, to get out there and take center stage and try to get the world, put the world to rights. You know, that's, that's a remarkable thing you're doing. And just continue with the human rights movement because you are touching so many people. I've been getting so many, so many letters and messages from all over the world that you, Mr. Reyes, are inspiring them. And that right there strengthens me. So, dude, just rock on. Thank you for giving me. Okay. It moves me profoundly to think that the man who tried to kill me because of the ways in which I was different learned to see the ways in which we were the same enough to call me brother. He hated me when he didn't know me, but in the end said he loved me. Mark grew up neglected and severely abused by his parents, leading to his first parole officer at the age of 12. Betrayed by loved ones, teachers, and even the criminal justice system, 
he ended his life in peace, receiving love, kindness, and mercy from the people he once hated, renewing his faith in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and in humanity. Before he was executed, his last words were, Hate is going on everywhere. It has to stop. Hate causes a lifetime of pain. I suffer terribly because of someone else's hatred, but it led me to uncover parts of myself, uh, myself I never would have discovered otherwise. I was able to make peace with my pain, transform hate into love, and turn a life tragedy into positive lifelong lessons for myself and countless others. My inner strength helped me to survive, driving me to transform the most difficult of challenges into my life's work. Though I could not save the life of Mark, I hoped I could help others like him and in turn save lives. The tremendous support and positive energy I received during my campaign inspired me to establish the nonprofit World Without Hate, to honor my deathbed wish and to continue my journey in inspiring, educating, and encouraging people to reach deeply within themselves so that together we can break the cycle of hate and violence. It seems clear that this uncertain and ever-changing public health crisis is going to be with us for the foreseeable future. Though a time of worry, unknown, and peril, it is also an opportunity for us to come together as neighbors, community members, and fellow human beings. Spend some time calling family, friends, or neighbors to see how they are doing. Isolation can be very difficult for many at this moment. If you head out, give a random act of kindness a try. Holding the door open for someone goes a long way today. Extend a helping hand. Perhaps your elderly neighbor would appreciate you walking their dog while they remain indoors. Donate to a local nonprofit desperately needing our financial contributions. Support your local business or neighborhood restaurant by purchasing a gift card. If you're able, give blood. Perhaps most importantly, if you need help or support, do not hesitate to reach out and ask for it. I am grateful for people like Richard who chose to stand beside me during one of my most vulnerable moments. If he hadn't helped me overcome my fear, I may have never had the opportunity to see those resembling my attacker as anything more than a threat. Sometimes, no matter how tough or happy we may seem on the outside, we all need a loving and kind word, an assurance that things will be all right, a gentle push to go the extra mile. From time to time, we all need a compassionate person like Richard in our lives, just as much as we have the power to be a Richard for others too. I truly believe the more we do for others, the more the path of our own happiness and common good will open. There are many paths toward peace and fulfillment and they all begin inside. We must commit to compassion and empathy as life's top priorities. It is not easy when our hearts are full of pain, fear, or anger, but by building a calm inner space, we can better control our emotions and actions and help change our world. Today, I'm not only going bald myself, but many of my close friends are handsome, bubble-headed, white men, some with very cool tattoos of their own. Remember, fear can push us to forget everything and run, or face everything 
and rise. What's your fear? What is your discomfort? What do you wish to change? What are you going to do today and tomorrow to make a positive impact? Thank you. Stay safe, stay healthy. Together, we will find our way through this. Thank you for viewing this online Rotary program. Nick and I are here to say, stay safe, continue having fun, and remember to follow the guidelines of our public health officials. Nick, let's close with a tip. How far away should we be from, from each other? Out of frame, oh, no, in frame. <laughs> Three feet, six feet. Three feet, that's the right answer. So let's say goodbye with a couple of uh, appropriate some, gestures. Some elbow? Yeah, some elbow. Some How about this one? Good, yep, yep, yep. All right. feet, feet. Feet in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. it's Excellent. like the hokey pokey. Join us next week for another online program highlighting one of the best speakers we've had at Rotary in recent years, Howard Bihar. This is an excellent talk on the importance of servant leadership, a particularly fitting topic in these crazy times.